Hello, my name is Rosa Mendez. I'm a senior at Westminster College and I will be presenting on the regulation of chaperone mediated autopagy by pharmacological activators and inhibitor inhibitors. This research was done under the mentorship of Raj Ghosh at the University of Utah and with the help of the McNair Scholar Program at Westminster College. So first of all, what is chaperone-mediated autopagy? Well, chaperone-mediated autopagy, or CMA, as I will be referring to from now on, it's an intracellular breakdown system, meaning that within the cell, it breaks things down. In this case, we're going to break down um, protein that it's either unhealthy or redundant, or it's just of not use of the cell into amino acids which again, amino acids are the building blocks of protein. There are two main parts to CMA. One is HSC70, which is our chaperone molecule, which acts just like a chaperone. It um, binds to the unhealthy protein and kind of just walks it down. This unhealthy protein has to have a very specific amino acid sequence which must be KFERQ. So within the protein, it must have that sequence. And it walks it down to our second important part, which is LAM2A, which is a door to the lysosome. And just as a quick reminder, lysosomes are organelles within a cell where things get broken down. Uh, so LAM2A recognizes HSC70 and it opens to allow the protein to get into the lysosome where it will get destroyed into amino acids or recycled into something else. So why is CMA important? Well, CMA is protective of various diseases. It will either go faster or go slowly or as slow, more slowly depending on the disease. Um, it has been linked to diseases such as hepatitis B, neurological diseases like Alzheimer, cancer, and COVID-19, which are all of our ongoing research to know how CMA interacts, but also how can we do something to help it. So even though we know how um, these diseases are linked to CMA, there's not a lot of methods to monitor CMA activity. That means that we don't know how much of these unhealthy proteins are actually getting destroyed by CMA? So our question is, how can we regulate chaperone-mediated autopagy using pharmacological agents? We wanted to use pharmacological agents because these are available to all scientists, and we didn't want to just produce something that will activate or uninhibit that as we want this to be accessible to other scientists. Our hypothesis is that we hypothesize that the pharmacological activators or inhibitors used to manipulate CMA pathway can serve as an effective tool to study the clearance or recycling or destroying mechanism in different disease conditions. This means that what we learn from our research will serve other scientists that are actually studying how to cure or treat these diseases to use CMA as one of the pathways that they could potentially upregulate or underregulate to prevent, cure, or treat diseases. We first, cho first chose our inhibitors. Um, all of our inhibitors interact with HSC70, which means that this step will not happen or, or will have slower at a slow at a slower rate. So um, when it will we so lam 2A and the destruction of the protein will likely not happen or it will happen at a very slow rate. And then we have our activators, with, uh, which upregulate the whole mechanism. We chose two activators, uh, both these two 
instead of acting with the chaperone molecule, they act with our daughter molecule and they kind of uh, increase how much substrate it can take so it makes it faster so there will be higher levels of our chopper and molecule as well as our door molecule so what did we do we obtained and grew cells um, we first grew endothelial cells which are cells that surrounds your blood vessels and then we have cardiac cells with our, your heart muscle cells then we treated our cells at different concentrations and then we intended to treat them at different times but due to the craziness of this year we only had time to do it for 24 hours and we also only had time to do one activator and one inhibitor for our inhibitor we used BIR 155008 and I will just be calling it BIR for now on in which um, the concentrations that we selected were previously tested on HSC-70 and it was just the HSC-70 chaperon molecule so we really don't didn't knew how it will interact in a cell level and then for our activator we chose human MG which uh, was previously tested on rat liver cells and these are the concentrations that we came up with. Uh, we had two plates for our endothelial cells and we just tested human MG on them. And then we had four plates for BER and we tested, I mean, for our cardiac cells and we tested both the activator and the incubator. Uh, as you can see on this plate, we um, put one concentration in each row and then so we had three wells for zero millimolar and then three wells for five millimolar and so on so once we treated our cells and incubated for 24 hours we collected the sample so we grabbed the sample and put it in a test tube and it was one for each well not one for each concentration then we sonificated to just break down all of the cells well so we could further see what proteins had the cells. Then we used a Bradford assay to know the concentration of protein and we looked for the lowest protein concentration and we normalized all of our other proteins to have that same concentration so that all of the levels of protein will be about the same and then we did western bloating and western bloating is a technique that allows allows us to see in a specific protein um what how do we do it we run a gel then we transfer that gel into a nitrocellular membrane which looks, looks kind of like a paper but it's not a paper then we block it using a primary and a secondary antibody. And in the case of HSC-70, we use BSA with non-fat milk and then C-block for LAM2A. Once uh, we incubated the incubated, we imaged the membrane and then that's ready to analyze. So these are our primary results. From the top part, you can see the actual imaging from our nitrocellular membrane. Uh, what this means is that a thicker, more darker bar has higher levels of protein, and then like a thin, more blurry, light line, it just means that there are lower levels of protein. And then um, on this side, we have our cardiac cells, and on the other side, we have our endothelial cells. As you can see, cardiac cells levels were tested for LAM2A levels and then for both the inhibitor and the activator and endothelial cells were only tested for the activator, but we were able to analyze for both LAM2A and HCC70. So uh, for LAM2A, 
for both uh, the cardiac and then the telial cells one for lam 2 a and the other one for HSC70. We can see from the image that about five millimolar, they have the same, like they have a more darker, thicker line, which just indicates higher levels of protein. Uh, we're not gonna talk about the um, imaging for lam 2 a for endothelial cells treated with hum humanine. That is because, um, it was very blurry and very hard to see and quantify. Then for our inhibitor burn in cardiac cells, we were expecting lower levels of proteins and we can see that at about 10 millimolar. And from the imaging, it's hard to actually tell which levels are which, so we have to quantify the data using a computer program. Uh, and again, as you can see from cardiac cells and endothelial cells using our activator, we can see that both at five millimolar, there's an increase of the levels of both LAM2A and HSC70. Then with BER, which is our incubator, we can see that for cardiac cells at, a, at about 10 micromolar, there's a decreased levels of LAM2A. So our results are favorable. They look very promising. As you can see, our incubator seems to be um, lowering the levels of the proteins, but um, and our activators seem to be upregulating the levels of our proteins again. However, we need to normalize our data to actually make any conclusions. Um, as you can see, there's kind of some curvatures in our image. Uh, that just means that there was some error within the loading, so I might have made a mistake when, lo when loading the, the gels, which just tells you that um, when we normalize the data, this might just say that we actually didn't get any data, which will suck, but it's okay, it's just science. Uh, we could also do, we can also look forward to analyze the media to quantify if cells are being killed. Uh, so the media is just where we feed and we grow cells. And we want to analyze the data for one reason. As you can see from this graph of very in cardiac cells, the levels of LAM2A for both uh, 0 millimolar and 20 millimolar, I mean micromolar, um, are way are the same and this can just indicate that we were killing cells and we think that because dmco it's a it's a toxic in cells so they might just be dying so we will also have to analyze it if it's worth killing our cells in order to inhibit cma and we will also want to explore the other inhibitors and activators that we didn't have time to do so, so that we can make actual conclusions or what are the best methods to monitor CMA. Thank you for your time and thank you for listening to me. I hope this was um, of your interest and it was informative. I will first like to thank my McNair program, especially Joe, Vanessa and Healy because um, they allowed me to work on this project. And I will especially like to thank Joe, which is retiring this year. I would like to thank uh, the University of Judah, especially Raj, who, which guide me through all of this process. The John, John David Simmons and Sian Budina for allowing me to work in their lives during these crazy times and especially for allowing me to work with them even though I'm an undergrad and I love the lab members. And if you have any more questions, my email is here and you can feel free to email me. Thank you so much and have a good day.